Um, very warm welcome to all of you uh, for this uh, School of Social Sciences IOE um, Golden Jubilee Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, very, very warm welcome to um, Professor Nivedita Menon, um, to all my colleagues, um, students, ladies and gentlemen, guests who are here. As I keep saying, I repeat the same same sentences uh, in every lecture, and uh, I, I think uh, there is merit in repeating those 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 words and those sentences, uh, especially in the Golden Jubilee year. Um, it's a kind of pledge. It's kind of statement of uh, belief, a shared purpose that the School of Social Sciences has stood for truth, beauty, courage, love, wisdom, intellectual rigor, all those qualities which has contributed to this university being visible and relevant. And I think, I think, I think it's a great testament to all the students and faculty and non-teaching staff for the last 50 years in the School of Social Sciences that they have made it possible. So it's 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 doubly um, a moment of great joy for me to be hosting this lecture this afternoon and welcoming Professor Nivedita Menon. Uh, professor Nivedita Menon is a writer and a professor of political thought at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. She taught variously at Lady Shiram College in the Department of Political Science, Delhi University. Uh, she has written books which have become classics, iconic books, uh, books like Seeing Like a Feminist, which was released in 2012. Uh, before that, she's written Power and Contestation, India since uh, 1989, uh, Recovering Subversion, uh, Feminist Politics Beyond the Law, and Gender and Politics in India. And her latest book is called Secularism as Misdirection, uh, after which the title of the lecture for today has been taken. Um, without uh, uh, delaying matters any further, uh, let me once again very, very warmly welcome Professor Nivedita Menon on behalf of the School of Social Sciences, on behalf of all of you. And ask her to deliver the Golden Jubilee uh, Distinguished Lecture titled Secularism as Misdirection. Professor Menon. Thank you very much, Jyotirmay. It's an enormous honor to be invited to deliver a lecture in this series. It's always a huge pleasure for me to come to HCU uh, which means something to us in the north of India. When I was telling a friend just now that it's really lovely to come to Hyderabad and breathe because it's not possible to breathe in Delhi, she said, uh, the pollution, eh? She said sympathetically. <laughs> I said, you know what? The pollution is less toxic than the other kind of breathing that I'm talking about. Um, so it's just great to be here. I love HCU. Thank you for having me here. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to salute the spirit of Rohit Vemala, which lives on in this university. Uh, and um, so I'll go into my lecture directly. Um, uh, so the title of the book also has a subtitle, uh, which is uh, Critical Thought from the Global South. Uh, so uh, the idea was to also write a book from the South, from India, from the South, uh, looking outwards and uh, using our experiences uh, and the experiences of the Global South more generally to theorize about larger processes, right? That was the idea in the book. Um, I'm using the term misdirection here in a very specific way. So it's not meant to imply uh, that there's a good 
secularism which is properly directed and then there's a bad secularism that is misdirected. So that is not the meaning of the term and I explain it in the very first sentence of the book. I draw the term misdirection from magic tricks. So what happens in magic tricks is misdirection is the process by which the magician does something fancy and spectacular and draws your attention towards the wrong side of the stage and the real stuff is happening on another side of the stage. So misdirection is a way of, uh, it's like the smoke and magic, uh, the smoke and mirrors kind of effect. Uh, and in, a, in the performance of a magic trick, misdirection involves drawing attention away from where the trick is happening. Um, so, uh, so the misdirection involves drawing attention away from where the trick is happening to another place or to other objects that are made to appear more fascinating. So in this book, I address the manner in which the master discourse of secularism and the grid of meanings that it produces affect such a misdirection. The field of meaning that this term secularism invokes structures our vision making certain objects and features hyper visible while obscuring others that are critical factors in contemporary politics and intellectual production. So in this lecture today, I will discuss two such instances of misleading hyper visibility, something called religion and something called women. Uh, that's what I will focus on in this lecture. But in the rest of the book, I also look at three other factors that are obscured by uh, uh, the discourse of secularism, the question of caste, capitalism, and the non-individuated self in the global south. And to address that, I've looked at psychoanalysis in the global south. But I assure you, I will not keep, here, keep you here to address all the chapters in the book. Uh, I will today uh, address and unpack these two objects, religion and women, and the way in which they emerge. Uh, I start from the vantage point of India, but I travel further afield to re revisit debates on secularism that even today assume a Western perspective as universal. So there are two key components to my argument. One, that state and religion are both elements of the political. They co-constitute each other the state and religion co-constitute each other, and that religion is not a clearly separable self-standing entity. And the second component of my argument is that secularism is not a value in itself. It is actually not something that contains any substantive values. It is merely a strategy of rule, and it is compatible with majoritarian anti-minority anti politics and capitalist transformation, as much as it may be used by democratic politics. So simply if you say secular democratic doesn't necessarily follow. Some of this is what I'm going to be outlining. Globally in the 20th and early and the 21st centuries, many significant debates and controversies around secularism have circulated around the social roles of bodies marked women. It is no accident, for instance, that the Islamic veil, and I'm doing all these air quotes because as we know, the, the veils, there are multiple forms of veils, not all veils are Islamic, but the idea of the Islamic veil all over the world and including India has so easily become a sign of the lack of secularism and progressive modern values. And this is not uh, uh, an accident. Uh, in the mid 20th century, Franz Fanon wrote a famous essay, Algeria Unveiled, in which he showed how French imperialism produced the veiled Algerian woman as the justification for French intervention. The veiled woman as a passive object produced by Arab patriarchy to be freed by French modernity. However, once Algerian revolutionary women started using their flowing hikes, the, the form of burqa that they wore, uh, as cover while carrying arms and ammunition, the hike shifted from being a sign of passivity to a marker of violence. Feminist scholars point out that such controversy referencing modernity often center on women's bodies, precisely because the patriarchal patrilineal family is at the heart of modern statecraft. Veena Das suggests that once the idea of God had been displaced, secular means had to be crafted to ensure that the sovereign receives life, as she puts it, beyond the lifetime of individual members. This then means that the state has a continuous interest in reproduction as well as in the form of the family. Just think about the fact that in the past few months, the Supreme Court of India has declared marriage to be something that it is their job to protect. 
they did this in the context of surrogacy they did this in the context of a divorce case this idea that marriage is something that the state has to protect has been explicitly articulated by the supreme court in india but this is what underlies state practice this is what uh, uh, what feminists have been arguing which means that the state has a continuous interest in reproduction as well as in the form of the family so das is uh, you know das is suggesting that the state has to reimagine its relation to the family in more complex ways than by merely assigning the family to the realm of the private so that's the discourse that the family is in the in the realm of the private but the supreme court keeps uttering and these utterances are very important in bringing the family into the public whether it is the islamic veil or sati in india you will remember the debates over sati in india or female circumcision in asia and africa women's bodies come to be located in a kind of whirling vortex of patriarchy and imperialism slash majoritarianism and women's resistance comes to be against one or both of these and women's resistance is always walking a razor's edge resistance to patriarchy may strengthen the hands of the colonizer uh, or the majoritarian state while resistance to the state may push women towards greater patriarchal control in their communities so it is genuinely a razor's edge but while decades of feminist scholarship have established that women's bodies are the site for the performance of both nationalism and community identity we also need to recognize that within this complex matrix in some cases women do exercise agency Uh, i i do admit that it's difficult to imagine women's agency in the context of sati or female circumcision which takes place on very little girls uh, but i'm willing to think it through and talk about it and there are ways in which we can talk about it but with the veil it becomes possible to find the space to theorize agency whether there is pressure to perform femininity through the display of the body uh which is also a form of patriarchy uh nawal sadwi the egyptian novelist famously said when white french feminists were marching in the streets uh, of france against the islamic veil she said i bet many of them are most of them are wearing makeup so makeup as a form of patriarchal veiling is and nawal sadwi uh, many of you would know has stood up with her life against patriarch islamic patriarchy as well uh but when she sees white french feminists marching against the veil that was her famous statement i bet many of them are wearing lipstick uh so uh, there is pressure to perform femininity in multiple ways through display of the body or to cover up and to protect community honor and in any either case the woman's decision to do either will be produced at the juncture of multiple historical processes imperialism majoritarian politics patriarchy family misogyny racism casteism and of course in cases such as religiously mandated covering up or the prohibition on women's temple entry uh, the woman's interpretation of faith is also very much part of the picture so i want to uh, uh, understand here how secular the discourse of secularism has enabled hindu supremacism in india i will be uh, i should say hindutva supremacism perhaps but since they speak as hindus i'm going to call it hindu supremacism also uh, i and i i'll i'll be saying this later on but the terms communalism religious fundamentalism religious revivalism these are no longer very useful uh, and what is as far as hindutva is concerned what we have is a clearly hindu supremacist state uh, so uh, it's interesting that there there are points at which uh, hindu supremacism functions as if it were secularism and obviously the most uh, obvious example that comes to mind is the question of the hijab in karnataka which you're all familiar with but i do want to go through it with you in this particular context so in early 2022 our screens filled with images of educational institutions in karnataka that barred their gates to women in the hijab the ostensible reason was that the hijab violated the uniform which students were expected to wear dense with implied violence these images of a hindu nationalist bjp ruled state evoked uh, similar policies by france the progenitor of a secularism defined as the hard separation of state and religion france is that example supposedly of the separation between state and religion we'll come back to france later but these images that we saw of hijab clad girls outside locked gates uh, captured in one frozen instant the ideological violence of the hindu rashtra here in th- is the marked and stigmatized muslim female body exiled from the resources of the nation kept out by iron gates to be admitted only on terms set by hindutva let us note that we are not talking about only 
uh, ideological violence. I say only because we know how po powerful and violent ideological violence is, but we are not talking only of ideological violence, of course, uh, the power of which we have witnessed in plenty since 2014 when the BJP came to power. We know the violence that mere words from the right quarters can unleash. Love jihad, gao hatya, kapdon se pehchane jayenge. Statements of this variety function as a dog whistle to Hindutva organizations that are emboldened to wreak actual violence, physical violence on, on Muslims. As more and more colleges in Karnataka denied entry to women wearing the hijab and therefore their right to education, the BJP government in Karnataka backed such moves invoking the Karnataka Education Act of 1983, section 133.2, which states that women, students, sorry, that students must wear a uniform chosen by the college authorities. The government's directive while invoking this section added, and I quote the government statement, clothes which disturb equality, integrity, and public law and order should not be worn. The first claim, therefore, is that the hijab violates uniformity of dress, hence equality. This is the first level of Hindutva ideology, familiar in India since the 1990s, presenting itself as the only genuinely non-discriminatory politics. Uh, and um, claiming that it is actually secular and hence the insult pseudo-secular. So this is very much a 90s kind of position. Uh, so those who accept and recognize religious difference are supposedly pseudo-secular. The claim to uniformity in policy was fraudulently de demonstrated in some colleges by a few students, male and female, who came wearing saffron shawls, implying that if the hijab was permitted, so should a Hindu form of dress. The colleges then, in an ostentatious gesture of even-handedness, banned both saffron shawls and the hijab. You understand what is going on here, why I'm talking about this in the context of secularism as a discourse that misdirects. So apparently what's going on is, and you will have noticed that the debates in social media and so on focused on the uniform, focused on how important it is that people should wear the uniform. So the 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 game of getting other students to wear saffron scarves, which have nothing to do with Hinduism at all, as we know was meant to reinforce the idea that this is even hand the state being even handed in terms of in in terms of the hijab so the college is then banned both saffron shawls and the hijab but as we know wearing saffron shawls, shawls is not any sort of religious or hindu requirement at all and groups of students suddenly wearing them to college obviously was stark evidence of political mobiliza mobilization by hindutva organizations the norm by which uniformity is created whether it's a uniform civil code or a uniform uh, will always be the dominant norm. If everyone has to be something or do some one thing, what will that something be? And who decides what that something must be? So inequality is not produced by difference, but by the failure in the public domain to acknowledge the existence of difference. And this as feminists and as uh, people from the left who have espoused secularism, there has been a huge discomfort with acknowledging difference in the public domain. Uh, and that's some, something that we need to take into account. So inequality actually is produced by the refusal to acknowledge the existence of dif difference in the public domain. The more important point to note is that the person who is assumed in the abstract to be the citizen is already distinguishable, is already marked by a particular kind of difference. It is precisely because by default, the abstract citizen of Europe is assumed to be white male and Christian, or in India to be Savarna male, North Indian and Hindu, that the introduction of black, female or Muslim identities in the mix is so threatening. In the directive of the Karnataka government, it is what is really interesting, however, is the invocation of integrity and public law and order. And that brings us to the more explicit Hindu Rashtra argument, which has emerged, which has moved away. So they are using two kinds of arguments. One is they are truly secular and that they are only interested in the uniform. But the other argument, um, so the more explicit uh, Hindu Rashtra argument that we have seen since 2014, uh, and which has emerged more and more in the public domain ever since the carnage of Muslims in Gujarat in 2002, and which has become the dominant discourse through much of India since 2014, is that that claim to be true secularists is used when they want to, like in Karnataka. But the explicit project now is that of the building of a Hindu Rasht, which marginalizes, assimilates, or physically eliminates minorities and all others who resist it. Revealingly, the High Court judgment, Karnataka High Court judgment, while ostensibly upholding the secular principle of hijab as violating the rule of identical uniforms, added that 
the insistence on wearing of parda veil or headgear in any community may hinder the process of emancipation of women in general and muslim women in particular the emancipation of women was not a question that was the court had been asked to consider at all the hindu rash narrative is clearly reflected in the way the karnataka high court mobilized constitutional provisions of gender equality to delegitimize muslim practices the integrity of the nation which they said and public law and order which they said is vitiated by the wearing of the hijab demands that all differences be subsumed under a north indian savarna masculinist version of hinduism and anything that defies this vision is culpable for the breakdown of public law and order so that's why law and order integrity is to present yourself as different in the public domain by your very body you are challenging the integrity of the nation and public law and order the responsibility of maintaining law and order result rests not on those who react violently to dissent and difference but on those the hindu rash identifies as dissenters as well as those who insist that their differences with the hindu rash should be noted so when the hijab issue was 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 boiling as it were in karnataka there was one kind of voice from among indian feminists that defended women's rights to education as well as to their religious beliefs and convictions my position was that but other feminists although staunchly anti hindu uh, supremacist nevertheless expressed discomfort with religious practices such as the veil that they saw as patriarchal and discriminatory so from uh, the first point of view the argument is that the decision to wear or discard the hijab or for that matter whether to accept or resist the ban on women's entry into temples and i will be talking about the shabrimala temple entry movement as well um, the argument is that it cannot be made on anybody else's behalf even not even by feminists the the, the reason for this is that uh, the idea of agency is not an easily accessible one when may women be considered to be victims needing protection and when as active agents engaging with or resisting power and carving out their own spaces the notion of choice is not enough to answer this question because freedom of choice is always exercised within strict boundaries that are non negotiable the boundaries that are defined by economic class by race by caste and of course by gender the freedom to choose is never absolute and yet within those limited boundaries people do make choices how are we as feminists or as any kind of i will use the short form progressive although i find it difficult problematic term but since everybody will understand what i mean when i say progressive politics when we are choosing from that uh, uh, from that point of view uh, how are we to understand these choices without invoking totalizing notions such as false consciousness now for the second point of view which is feminists opposed to hindu rashtra who were uncomfortable with and not happy with the idea of the veil at all i'm going to take the representative instance of noor jahan safia niaz co-founder of the bharatiya muslim mahila andolan which fought the triple talaq case in the supreme court and won so that judgment came because of a huge grassroots movement by the bmma the bharatiya muslim mahila andolan and uh, what uh, nurja safia niaz said was in in an interview is that the covering of heads or faces by women is not a cultural aspect of the muslim community alone and should not be seen as specific to islam that was one point that she made about you know she was talking about how north indian women uh, non muslim women were wear a ghungat and cover their face and so on so it's not specifically islamic that was one argument she made but the second argument she made was that the hijab is not necessary to being a faithful practicing muslim and she said there are i'm quoting her there are other ways of asserting one's muslim identity that, that the hijab is essential to islam is also a superficial reductionist understanding of the religion islam is not about how much of my head is covered or how long is my abaya islam is about equality justice wisdom compassion prayers fasting that is the basis of islam now so this is from the bmma making a an ambiguous feminist articulation but of course uh, what what so we we need to be able to see this point of view as coming from a different location obviously than the hindu right arguing that the hijab is not essential to islam because many practicing muslim women do not wear it so they were using in a sense the same argument uh but that doesn't mean that you cannot make the argument in a strong feminist way and so they tried to make it that hijab is a matter of personal choice and it then is therefore legitimate to ban it in educational institutions where students are expected to wear 
uh, uniform. Now, I won't go into a particular interesting legal conundrum in India. It's a particular, but we can talk about it in the discussion if you like. But there's something called the Essential Religious Practices Test (ERP). I mean, ERP is what it has just come to be called. But what happens is that a number of cases reach the court on these grounds: Is such and such a thing? an essential religious practice of such and such a religion. And then the court determines on the basis of arguments placed before it, uh, whether it is an essential religious practice or not. And the legal scholar Gautam Bhatia has argued that it's an extremely retrogressive idea to use because it establishes the idea of essential religious practices establishes a religious community as homogenous. Uh, it accepts the dominant voice on what is the essential religious practice. So Gautam Bhatia's argument is that something like the idea of the hijab should be tested solely on the question of freedom to practice religion the way you want to practice your religion, rather than something being an essential religious practice or not. And I think that's a very, so you notice we're already heading into quite clearly into the domain that I indicated in the beginning that the state determines what religion is that state and religion co-constitute each other. There is no such thing as religion that exists outside of the state, visible for all to see. Uh, so so, uh, so in, in many ways, uh, uh, one should see uh, Niaz's voice as one voice from within the Muslim community. And there are other voices which believe that to wear uh, the hijab is the way in which they feel uh, closer to their religious beliefs. Uh, so it's not, we should not, we should recognize that is whether the question of whether something is essential to a religion or not is not for anyone to decide, least of all the courts. Because then that decision is made on the basis of dominant voices, which will go with certain kinds of texts and certain kinds of arguments and set up that society, that community as homogenous. Of course, this perspective that this the Muslim women don't need to wear the hijab became even more strident in the Indian public domain when the Iranian revolution against the authoritarian regime there took off in 2022. As you remember, rejection of the mandatory headscarf was a central demand of the very militant Iranian women's resistance to rule by authoritarian Islam. Now, the only way I think this conundrum can be unraveled is by recognizing that both women and religion are misleading categories here and in all such debates. And this complex un understanding was best articulated, in my opinion, by a panel discussion by Iranian women on the forum Jadalia. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. J-A-D-A-L-I-Y-Y-A. I urge you to go find it. It's a website. On the, uh, so that panel discussion among Iranian women was on the ongoing struggle of the Iranian people against a regime in the hands of patriarchal mullahs. They made it clear that the struggle is not against Islam and it is not about hijab everywhere and at all times, what they, they were opposed to the, to the Iranian state. They were opposed to uh, the forcible um, for, uh, enforced uh, hijab. And um, they made it clear that the struggle is not against Islam and not about hijab everywhere and at all times. What we are witnessing in Iran, they said, is reflected all over the world, wherever there is resistance to the gendered ways in which all states control populations. This may be by compulsory conscription in wars of men, mostly, that people have no interest in. And at that time in Russia, we were seeing on television screens whenever the mainstream media chose to report it, Russian men were fleeing their country to avoid military service in Putin's war on Ukraine, right? So they were, so, so what they're saying is that this is this kind of resistance, if you frame it as religion and women, you're missing the point. The point is that the state controls populations in multiple ways and gendered control of overpopulations is an important aspect uh, of the state's control. And this, this, this idea or the space that is designated as religion is a very important tool in the arsenal of the state to control uh, uh, people. So which is... Please uh, let me immediately clarify, and I hope that's very clear. This is not to say that people don't have faith themselves and people don't belong to religions and believe in those religions. The point is that I'm using the term religion, but the moment you start trying to unpack it or if I ask you to define it, the definitions will come from legal documents. It will come from the way the state defines something, which means that we have to think of ways in which people observe their faith below the radar of the state, outside that, and then what is that? Right? What are those spiritual uh, 
um, so Russian men was uh, fleeing the country or uh, it could be by making the hijab central to reasons of state in Iran by compulsory veiling, in France and India by compulsorily unveiling the Muslim woman, in the USA by denying autonomy over their bodies to women by criminalizing abortion. The way in which this panel resituated the hijab issue out of the unquestioned categories of both religion and women was very productive. Then uh, the case reached the Indian Supreme Court and as you know, it's a split verdict. It is now going to come up again. But let's take a quick look at French secularism as majoritarianism. France instituted a ban on what was called conspicuous religious symbols in public institutions in 2010. This, term, this was a coded term. It was a coded term referring essentially to what was called the Islamic headscarf. Scarves worn for other than religious practices. Uh, religious purposes, for example, fashion statement uh, or a protection of hairstyle. Those are not considered by the French state to be a problem. So it is inside what you feel when you wear the headscarf that is the problem. Think about it. Look, look at the definition of what religion is. If I go out with a scarf and I'm white, I could be Muslim, but I will not be asked because wearing a, French, a scarf the French way, look, look it up, look up style blogs how to wear a French scarf like a stylish French woman. They'll tell you. But those French women cannot be Muslim. Or if they are Muslim, they have to pretend it's about style. Something is going on here, right? It's not very clear. There's a lot of interesting slippages. In, for instance, 11 years after the French ban, as the European Union now considers strict limitations on Islamic head scarves, French style blogs and magazines continue to promote head covering scarves worn like a French woman. Presumably, this style is meant exclusively exclusively to refer to headscarves worn by French women who are not also practicing Muslims. Many swimming pools and beaches in France have banned the burkini, a body covering outfit some Muslim women wear at the beach. It's like a full churidar and t-shirt, uh, full sleeved, etc. Uh, so, so they banned the burkini because that's seen as, again, a non-secular practice. Uh, one response by municipal authorities in 2019 to the protests and defiance of the ban by Muslim activist groups and by citizens' right groups was the closure of two swimming pools in southeast France. And in May 2021, the city took heed of the continuing protests, permitted sw swimmers at public pools to use burkinis. But later that month, the city's administrative tribunal overruled the decision as contravening hygiene and security rules. You see, the invocation is continuously of some kind of secular value. Hygiene, public order, security rules, and the ban on the burkini was finally upheld in 2022, uh, which invoked principles of religious neutrality. So the court banned the burkini, banned women from being at the beach in churidars and arm covering dress because it, uh, it, 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 it violates the principles of religious neutrality. And in the, and in the, in the service of this re religious neutrality, for some years earlier, four armed policemen in Nice had forced a burkini clad woman to remove some of her clothing, fining her for not wearing, I quote, an outfit respecting good morals and secularism. Morals and secularism. I think we should just exchange our cops, send the French policeman here and send the Indian policeman there so that Indian policemen learn that wearing a bikini is about respecting morals. And uh, French policemen would learn that covering up is an instance of morals. Uh, meanwhile, the most conspicuous religious symbol of all in France, the habit worn by nuns, is not an issue in the French public domain. Uh, that, that, um, what is uniform is what the dominant, what the dominant uh, uh, value is. So, uh, in fact, in response to the Nice incident, many women posted pictures of nuns on that very beach, walking in their habits to highlight the country's double standards. Because in France, of course, it's the Catholic Church, which is, uh, which is the state. I mean, this, this idea that secularism is separation of state and religion is a fable. And that's one of the things that I'm unpacking as we go along. Of course, in a notable parallel, we know that the BJP chief minister of Uttar Pradesh habitually wears the saffron which identifies him as a yogi. Similarly, so that's a public domain. He's occupying a public office and he dresses like a Hindu yogi. Uh, similarly, Sikh turbans were permitted under the rule in Karnataka. Sikh turbans were permitted because the state government defined them as a constitutional right. Now, what was happening here was not giving a right to Sikhs. 
it was assimilating Sikhs into the fold of Hinduism. It was recognizing Sikhs as Hindus and making explicit which religious identity works implicitly as the norm in the public domain and which is illegitimate. The more fundamental aspect that underlies this double standard has been made invisible for built into secularism understand, uh, understood as in uniformity is the implicit requirement that all citizens adhere to the dominant norm. What is called secularism in France and in Europe generally was achieved in the 17th century only after the defeat of rival Christian denominations and diverse cultural practices, so centuries of war, etc. And the religio-cultural formation that was victorious then atta attained the status of the secular universal. Um, so to conclude this discussion, we may note that French secularism assumes as normal dominant Christian and Western cultural norms both has played out on women's bodies. These norms are, are defended as played out on women's bodies and defended on grounds of hygiene and religious neutrality. And this normalization makes visible only Muslim practices as supposedly defiling the supposedly neutral public domain. Uh, and in India, Hindutva politics adopts two stances. At times, the stance is assertively Hindu majoritarian uh, and Hindu supremacist. At others, it claims to defend true secularism as uniformity. And the latter stance is entirely compatible with majoritarianism and French secularism, the, 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 the similarities between French secularism and Hindu supremacism in India are stark. The arguments are the same. The style of functioning is the same. The name of one is secularism. The name of the other is, uh, well, we should call it Hindu supremacism. Um, it's, it's important for me now to take a little detour into the kind of debates that we've had on secular, secular secularization across the globe and to remind ourselves how these terms actually arise and how they work. So the term secular arises from the history of Christianity and describes that which is not sacred or not of the church. The term secularization thus refers to the process by which human activity and knowledge progressively come under the control of scientific rather than religious understanding. So you'll remember that Weber termed this the rational, termed this rationalization and intellectualization characteristic of modern times as the disenchantment of the world. Now, uh, if, so Jose Casanova distinguishes between three meanings of the term seculariz secularization. One is the decline of religious beliefs and practices in societies as they grow more modern. This is the understanding. He's not holding on to it. He's telling us this, these are the three ways in which secularization is understood. As societies become more modern, religious practices decline. The second is the privatization of religion seen as a prerequisite for modern liberal democracies. And the third is the one that we all tend to mean or people think they tend to mean. When you start unpacking it, it's not what they mean at all but which is the separation of secular realms from religious institutions and norms. So this last meaning, which is the one that we tend to think of when we say secularism, is associated with Europe in the 17th century. And Talal Asad's well-known argument is foundational for this understanding that religion as a historical category and a universal globalized concept is a construction of Western secular modernity. Western secular modernity creates the category of religion as a universal globalized concept. Uh, so then if we look at the different kinds of ways in which other societies in the global south have been, we find that there are multiple and diverse secularizations in the west as, as Casanova puts it. Uh, for instance, the, he says that the Protestant Reformation was anti-popish but not anti-religious in the West, for its purpose was precisely to bring religion to the world and the world to religion. So separating state and religion became a particular requirement in such a society. This process cannot be assumed to have universal validity because in non-Western cultures generally, as Humera Iktidar puts it, there was no hierarchical structured church that had inherited an empire state apparatus as the Roman Catholic Church did in Europe. So the assumed lack of secularization within these societies is not due to some lack on their part, some stupidity on our, on our part, on the part of the Global South, some lateness, something that we missed out on. It, that's not the reason. Humera Iktidar puts it this, this way, they did not secularize in the way that Europe did because they did not need to. Uh, 
In other words, the sacred and secular were not necessarily separate spheres in the context of the political, but neither were they fused together as in medieval Christendom. And in that sense, a certain separation between them existed already. So let me just quickly go through some of the scholarship, which, for example, talks, out, talks about different parts uh, and different forms of religious institutions in the world. You see, I don't have a word to replace the word religion yet, so I will say religion, but with this caveat that I've already pointed out. So it has been pointed out that Kautilya's Arthashastra, for example, functions with a secular notion in that sense, secular in the sense of non-religious notion of statecraft. It acknowledges the Vedas as only one of the source of, sources of law. Writers in the early Arthashastra tradition exclude the Vedas from the class of sciences on the ground that these works are a superfluity or according to another interpretation, a hindrance in the world of men. So that tradition, the Arthashastra tradition, does not give the same place to Vedic religion in matters of kingship and rule that Christianity does to the Bible and the biblical tradition in the West. There was a mutual imbrication of religion and political power without being a fusion of the two. Islam, Muzaffar Alam has pointed out, has no church or clergy. And after the first four Khalifas, the Khilafat and Sultanate were not conjoined. Uh, Alam points out that over the Sultanate period of the 13th and 14th centuries, political power in North India was not based on Sharia law, and the actual governing practices varied a great deal. Thus, although the Sharia was one of the elements legitimizing rule, it was only a source of legitimacy, not power. The state did not impose Sharia through a centralized mechanism. In the context of Confucianism and Taoism, Casanova observes that their model of transcendence cannot be called religious in any strict sense, and they have no ecclesiastical organization. Such religions have always been worldly or lay, and do not need to undergo a process of secularization. So, so the point is that if you look at different parts of the global south, the idea that secularism is a value it's an important value. The Europe attained it in the 17th, 18th centuries, and the rest of the world is struggling to, failing to achieve it, is part of that whole kind of autobiography of the European Enlightenment, in which the rest of the world is always lacking and trying to catch up, whether it is development, whether it is democracy, whether, it, unless you reach the, the le now I, I can, I imagine that some of you are thinking that, but this is what the Hindu right says, now we'll come to that. But we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, frame our arguments in fear that uh, a fascist regime will use whatever argument it wants. It uses every argument that it wants. That doesn't mean that we will cease to say, because, because de the decolonial project far predates uh, Hindutva. And we'll, we'll talk about that very briefly later. So what we are saying is that uh, this idea that separation of state and religion is needed is something that is very specific to Europe. And all of you have heard this very, even if you haven't read the book, this phrase has become very common, provincializing Europe, the Pesh Chakrabartis. So you have to understand, we have to accept that that is a particular experience of a particular, it's a particular spatio-temporal experience, which has a certain meaning. Let's give it that meaning and not assume that it has to be universalized. Um, so, in fact, Casanova puts it very starkly that there can be modern societies like the United States, which are secular while deeply religious. And there can be pre-modern societies like China, which from our, from his Eurocentric religious perspective, look deeply secular and irreligious. So there's a broad, broad range of ways in which this happens. And in the late 20th century, it came, has, it had came to be widely recognized. What I'm saying is not a brand new argument by any means. I'm drawing on actually decades of scholarship. So in the late 20th century, it came to be recognized that secularism is not a neutral descriptive term with universal applicability, but that it arises from a spe specific spatio-temporal context. Hindu nationalist politics in India has been pressing an understanding of secularism as uniformity, which suits a majoritarian anti-minority rights politics. Uh, it also pushes the idea that secularism in India has meant the separation of state and religion. Uh, so you will find various kinds of uh, people who claim to be religious heads uh, saying the big problem in India has been secularism and that there has been a separation of state and religion, when in fact there has never been a separation of state and religion in that sense, as, as I pointed out, the, especially after the coming of the colonial government, the state's job has been to define what is religion continuously. So there's never, and usually that definition has worked to the benefit 
of the majority uh, religion and the dominant voices in that religion. Um, now, scholars have pointed out that the apparent secularism of Western states is normed as Christian. This we saw in the context of France and June Scott puts it this way, that state sovereignty and Christian practice become inextricably intertwined to take just two instances, the observing of the weekly holiday on Sunday rather than any other day is biblical in origin. And in many secular Western states, legal access to abortion is curtailed by Christian right-wing values that saturate state institutions. So June Scott makes this argument and she suggests that gender inequality is fundamental to the articulation of the separation of church and state that inaugurated Western modernity. And she proceeds to demonstrate how hollow the claims of Western powers are when they invoke women's rights to invade is Islamic states, demonstrating conclusively that gender equality would in fact thoroughly destabilize the West's political and social order. So we know that the paradoxes of Western secularism have been explained by Talal Asad. There's a certain kind of a critique of secularism that has been made by Ashish Nandi, which we're all very familiar with since uh, the 1985. And he developed his views on the striking link between the violence of the modern nation state and secularism. Uh, so we are familiar with all of these. Uh, and what and why I suggested earlier and why I want to state it again uh, is that terms like communalism, uh, which served a particular purpose, uh, no longer explain what is happening because from the 1990s onwards, the advance of Hindu communalism, what was called communalism, lay in this that it gradually occupied the space of nationalism. And Politics based on Muslim identity can always only be communal or anti-national. Only Hindutva politics. So Hindutva politics becomes the voice, the voice of the nation. They claim to be the voice of the nation. Uh, we can no longer see Hindu nationalism as something on par with community consciousness among other minorities. So we need to, I think, also rethink ideas of religious fundamentalism, religious revivalism, which su suggests a return to something, a reviving of something older. But in fact, it is a process of constructing modern identities. And I'm drawing on Ashish Nandi when I say this. Uh, it is a construction of modern identities in the contemporary moment by a selective interpretation from elements within a body of knowledge identified as religion. Uh, and uh, I, I do distinguish this from the many kinds of faith-based and spiritual practices that do not seek state power. And they often do not even seek recognition by the state. So I'm setting aside something which I will for the moment say sp called spiritualism, which is not organized religion in this sense, but we can it will take some time to unpack that, so we can come back to that. Now, when I say the state determines religion, um, I want to point to the fact that, and I'm leading now to the story of Shabri Mala, with which I will conclude, uh, that secularism everywhere, both in the West and India, involves the continuous regulation by the state, largely through the legislature and the judiciary, of what constitutes religious as opposed to non-religious practices and institutions. Sometimes the judiciary has to decide whether freedom of religion impinges on the obligations of citizens to the state. Others, it at others, it must adjudicate between uh, individual freedoms or individual access to state mandated benefits, which a religious community may refuse on the grounds of its belief. So this is all over the world. This is not just here. At such time, so that is someone might, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses refuse to, uh, refuse to participate in the army, refuse to work in the army. They will not sing the national anthem, these kinds of things. Uh, at such times, the very idea of what constitutes religion and belief is determined by the state, ostensibly as a neutral arbiter, but in fact, always driven by the political forces that control the government or the judiciary. Um, and there are times when the judiciary and government are not in consonance, at others, they reflect the same political beliefs. This state regulation of what constitutes religion is not a perversion of secularism. On the contrary, it is what constitutes the very heart of the practice of secularism. This is why a certain kind of debate on secularism that centers around religious belief and its place in a democracy is, in my opinion, misplaced. So if you look at, um, uh, uh, for example, let me take a very quick look at the United States. States of America, where the legal apparatus of the state has periodically defined what religion is by deciding whether particular forms of public behavior come under the principle of freedom of religion. Can you, if you say I refuse to join, uh, be drafted into the army, for example, is that a religious belief or not is what the judge, the court has to decide. 
And uh, it's interesting that in 1980, so between 1890 to 1981, the understanding of what constitutes religion expanded and narrowed back and forth uh, when faced with different kinds of resistance to state policy. In 1981, the Supreme Court made a distinction between a religious choice and a personal philosophical choice and refused to protect the latter. So if you say, I will not join the army because I am a pacifist and I don't believe in war, that is not acceptable unless you can show that you are part of a community of people who all express the same thing in a language that the court recognizes as religion. And that also was a huge debate. In the, do you have to use, uh, for example, uh, is there a belief in uh, a supreme creator? Uh, is there a so you have to you have to be able to show that it is a religion you can't make other other kinds of uh, assertions are not seen as religious we'll see this in the shabrimala temple uh, too other kinds of things are political activism this is religious belief so you have to be able to prove that it's religious belief to a court which will decide this is religious and not merely a philosophical belief so this is interesting right i mean you can see how slippery this this category of religion is um, if you, when you, when you come to India again, uh, we find that um, translations of the word, translations of the word secularism in India really express very different relationship between state and religion, very different from European notions of the church state separation. But for decades, the Indian versions were seen as simply translating the English concept of separation between state and religion in some deficient way. Somehow we don't have the proper word for it, right? So it's either dharma or sarva dharma samabhav. And uh, it was somehow, somehow not capturing the real meaning of secularism, which is what? By now we can see what is the real meaning of, say, in the US, in France, what is the real meaning of secularism? There is no such thing, but somehow it's the global south which has to constantly prove that it is doing this job properly. Uh, this was despite the fact that the Indian versions are actually closer to traditions in the Indian subcontinent where multiple religious and cultural communities have coexisted despite long histories of violence. It is not my claim that we've all, it's all been touchy-feely, loving, etc. In fact, Dr. Chiriangandath has used this term, I think he used the term back-to-back -back communalism of the communities of Kerala, which let each, let the communities do whatever they want, but don't let our daughters marry their sons. That should not happen. So you don't necessarily respect or love one another, but you do your thing, we'll do ours. He called it back-to-back -back communalism. So I'm not implying, and nobody at least any longer is implying that there was this very beautiful golden age when all the communities lived together in love and longing. Uh, but uh, although love and longing and, and, and illegitimate forms of love and lo longing have always burst out of this. That's a different matter. Uh, but um, so multiple religious and cultural communities have coexisted despite long histories of violence, whether in mutual cooperation, ongoing tension, or by deftly managing conflict. In the Indian subcontinent, no philosophical tradition, Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic, Sikh, etc., has seen the state as entirely separate from religion. Uh, but as we saw, they've never been fused either, state and religion. This is the reason why the term secularism was not in the original preamble. So if the current government suddenly produces the so-called original preamble without the term secular on the 26th of January this year, it doesn't mean anything. It means it did not need to be said. Because what Dr. Ambedkar said was that the constitution already reflected in its entirety the values of secularism which he interpreted as non-discrimination on grounds of religion, equal rights and status to all citizens. The term secularism is misleading because it comes from a different philosophical context. It has a different meaning. We don't need to use that term. We will say sarvadharm samabhav. We'll say unity in diversity. Uh, there's also a phrase uh, in, I'm now forgetting it. Uh, it, it. It's unity in diversity in, I think, Arabic or Persian. What is it? No. Um, so these are all, when you hear it, I just can't remember it at this moment. You, when you hear it, you will know. So these are all terms in, with which we have lived, right? And, and so, uh, so the term secular, it was not felt as necessary uh, to say in the preamble because it didn't convey anything. It was misleading. 
and the values of the constitution dr ambedkar said are already establishing what you might want to achieve with that and as you know the term was inserted 26 years later through a uh, constitutional amendment at a time when democracy was 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 at a standstill during the emergency so uh, the, I, I've been making the argument in different ways that the interpenetration of state, religion, and religious community-based politics is very intimate and driven by political compulsions and ideologies. And you see these tensions in the Indian Constitution. And I think the, I never, almost never, use the word tension in a negative sense. It's a productive tension, uh, where, where, for example, it prescribes state. Uh, it prescribes caste discrimination and ensures temple entry for example while simultaneously protect protecting the right to freedom of religion <clears throat> this second aspect of the state self perceived function intervening in religious communities to bring about equality is not associated with secularism in the classical sense at all uh, because their religious is precisely the opposite of secular so i want to now so i'm saying that they're implicated this is not a uh, this is not some kind of uh, um uh, contradiction that is the way in which secularism functions and i'll conclude by asking this question can bharat mata enter the shabrimala temple now for hindu supremacism while muslim women are to be freed from the veil hindu women are to be carefully controlled so that they do not marry muslims convert expand the population of muslims in india hence the bogi of love jihad uh, you know it's not even funny anymore because this specifically they say it and people are killed on this basis uh, the supposed campaign of muslim men to seduce hindu women is called love jihad and the violent policing by vigilante groups of relationships between hindu muslim hindu women and muslim men is well known Now the Shabrimala Temple story encapsulates the two themes of my lecture in the best possible way the manner in which what is termed religion is expected to be determined by the state in this case represented by the court and how the truth of religion is assumed to be discovered etched on the bodies of women this is what we have found throughout what is religion will be determined by the court and the court will find it on the bodies of women In 2018 the Supreme Court by a 4-1 decision declared the ban on women's entry into the Shabrimala temple as unconstitutional after the, but af, even after this order women who attempted the arduous trek up to the temple were physically attacked by men and finally only two women a nair and a dalit performed the pilgrimage under police escort more than 50 petitions seeking a review of the 2018 judgment were immediately filed by various organizations including a women's organization of ayappa devotees which called themselves happy to wait till they reach the post menopausal age that's what happy to wait means in case you were wondering in 2019 the supreme court delivered a judgment keeping the review petitions pending clubbing them with several other petitions challenging what discrimination against women Uh, in religious practices some of them were not even filed by women of that community for example entry of women into uh, the uh, uh, fire temple of parsi women as far as i know is not by a parsi woman uh, haji ali i think uh, there's there was some a petition on haji ali there's female genital mutilation among dawudi boras all these have been um, entry of muslim women into mosques all these have been set aside as a bunch of petitions to be heard so that's going on meanwhile uh, the court ordered that its judgment permit meeting entry of women into the shabrimala temple should stand but in 2020 the temple board which administers the temple declared once again on its portal that all women below 50 years of age would be denied entry adding this to covid linked restrictions so this is blatant contempt of court but it has not been challenged by the kerala government or by anybody else now what is interesting is the dissenting judgment i'll just take 5 more minutes the dissenting judgment by the only woman judge involved in that verdict uh, that is justice indu malhotra who said that her main argument was that courts cannot impose their rationality on religion and faith but what is in so what sounds perfectly legitimate courts cannot impose their rationality on faith it's what people believe but the supreme court judgment was not in fact looking at faith at all what was in the supreme court in the supreme court was an earlier kerala high court judgment of 1991 that was being challenged it's like an onion you keep peeling it it's courts all the way down right so the kerala high court judgment of 1991 which in 1991 on a petition by a 24 year old man mahindran uh he who was appalled by the sight of a young woman trekking up 
to the shrine. So Mahindran went to Kerala High Court and the Kerala High Court directed the Shabarimala Temple Trust to prohibit the entry of women of menstruating age, that is between 10 and 50, into the temple. So it was the High Court that banned the entry of women, that is law, and uh, told the legislature, that is the Kerala government, to use the police to enforce the order to ban the entry of women into temple. Specifically, Kerala High Court said, use the police to ban the entry of women. I'm not sure why Justice Malhotra felt there was any faith involved here. Um, and it was an appeal against this judgment that the Supreme, High, Supreme Court was, was hearing. Now, why was the Kerala High Court judgment necessary in 1991? Why did the Kerala High Court have to say stop entry of women at all costs? Because many women were in fact performing the pilgrimage to Shabarimala. And it's only around 1970s, according to scholars of Kerala, that a strict ban seeks is sought to be imposed. Because women were going there. They were going for the first food of children uh, event, uh, you know, the ceremony in which children are fed, uh, choruna, fed food for the first time, etc. So it's only around the 1970s that the, so the ban on women entering the Shabrimala temple emerges with the gradual Brahminization of what was most probably in ancient times a Buddhist shrine and prior to that a Dravidian or Adivasi shrine to a forest god because Ayyappan is a very, very mysterious idol with many mysterious origin stories. And of course, he's at the, uh, the, the this idol is at the top of an Im almost impenetrable forest, etc. Uh, and it's a, it's a very arduous trek. So it's with the, uh, uh, the, it's the push for a ban on women's entry, in fact, grows stronger with the Brahminization of the shrine. And um, what happens is that Justice Malhotra also rejected the plea that excluding women of the ages 10 to 50 amounts to untouchability. Justice Chandrachud had compared it to untouchability. And she said that all forms of exclusion do not constitute untouchability. In addition, she stated that to forbid women entry was not a discriminatory provision because all women as a class were not being excluded, only women of a specified age group. Now, untouchability as a practice uh, uh, cannot simply be equated with all forms of exclusion. I'm in agreement with her because the full horror of untouchability is lost by analogizing it with exclusion more generally. So, uh, but we must remember that the move, uh, the movement for women to enter Shabrimala temple was part of a longer history of entry of uh, Dalits into temples uh, in Kerala. But Justice Malhotra's reading failed to touch upon the significance of the age group excluded which was on the assumption of menstruation as polluting and based on the very presence of women of a certain age as threats to male celibacy, the deity of Ayapa being claimed as a brahmachari or, or as a celibate. Now, I'm now going to be moving gradually into in the next another three minutes uh, into a factor that, as I said, secularism uh, obfuscates, which is the category of caste. And that uh, is another long story, but I will touch upon it now because it is necessary to understand at what point in history menstruation begins to be seen as polluting. This could not possibly have originated with or been practiced during the worship of Priyarian goddesses of fertility and destruction. And certainly not in the matrilineal communities of Kerala where the onset of menstruation was celebrated like a festival well into the middle of the 20th century. Menstruation seen as pollution Polluting is a consequence of the expansion of Aryan patriarchal religious practices across the subcontinent. What is more interesting here is to consider the fact that by the 19th century or so, the heterogeneous communities labeled Hindus who accepted Brahminism had mostly come to see menstruation as polluting and certainly devout Hindu women stopped entering temples during their periods. Why was then the additional precaution necessary only for Shabarimala temple that no woman of menstruating age should enter it? So this entails the argument that all women within their menstruating age are polluting at all times or else that women are likely to lie, right? Now this assumption, contra meaning they might lie and they might go into the temple while they're in their periods. Now this assumption contrasts with the trust reposed in male devotees because male pilgrims to Shabrimala are required to have kept a 40-day vratam, an oath of celibacy and to observe a long list of other kinds of required good conduct. This is believed without verification. What is evident throughout the process is the powerful misogyny and fear of female sexuality that marks Brahminism because the woman of menstruating age is a sexual being. The very clear, may I request you not to record parts of my lecture because I'm not sure how parts of my lecture will get circulated. Thank you. <laughs>
the very claim that Ayappa is celibate appears to be a later 20th century addition to bolster the argument against women's entry because it's only in a film entitled, a movie entitled Swami Ayyappan uh, that the idea that Ayyappan is a celibate even emerges. So once again, we have a tradition of, mo tradition of modern origin. Uh, <clears throat> it's also interesting to note that transgender people are permitted into the Shabrimala temple. Neither they nor men are seen to pose a threat to Ayyappan celibacy. The heteronormativity attributed to Ayyappan, who is believed in one of the stories of his birth to be the progeny of two male gods, is revealing in that it's clearly a modern understanding. So the Supreme Court decision was not a judicial review of ancient faith, but an overturning of a previous legal interpretation of human, not divinely ordained practice. It's also worth noting that women wanting to enter the Shabarimala temple were invariably referred to in the media and by political leaders as activists. This is that philosophical belief. Only. <coughs> they were called activists and the men who explicitly mobilized to prevent their entry physically are called pilgrims. It's always male pilgrims and female activists. Please take a look at the media reports on, I dare you to find anything calling a woman attempting to go up to Shabrimala a devotee. Males are devotees, women are activists. Uh, it seems the legitimacy of faith is permitted only to Brahminical practices. So the RSS constructed southern North Indian Aryan vision of the mother, Bharat Mata, is not the only one on this subcontinent. There are other more autonomous, darker mothers who are rendered illegitimate in Hindutva discourse. These dark goddesses, fears and sexual are disowned by their Hindu sons. One of the many hundreds of police complaints filed since 2014 on account of hurt Hindu sentiments wasn't last page. Was in 2022, Jyotirmaya is like, okay, so uh, one of the many hundreds of police complaints filed since 2014 on account of hurt Hindu sentiments was in 2022 against a Canada-based filmmaker originally from India, Lina Manimekalai, who shared a poster of a film showing an actor dressed as the goddess Kali smoking a cigarette. It is worth understanding whose religious sentiments are hurt by this. After all, as many others also pointed out, Kali is the goddess of destruction. Uh, her offerings even today in many temples are alcohol and meat. While in Manimekalai's poster, she's merely smoking a cigarette. But the cigarette smoking woman in Indian popular culture represents something. The cigarette smoking woman represents a sexually free rebellious spirit. Uh, not someone who's risking her lungs uh, or anyone as anyone who smokes does because I really I don't smoke and I don't encourage smoking but <laughs> but uh, the cigarette smoking woman in Indian popular culture represents a sexually free rebellious spirit and highlighting that aspect of the goddess is what has hurt her Savarna Hindu sons the goddess as sexually free and immoral when Hindutva ideologues talk of decolonization, therefore, what they are attempting is a recolonization of the heterogeneous, non Brahminical, and Dalit Bahujan Adivasi traditions and practices of the subcontinent through the violence of Brahminical assertion and assimilation. A true project of decolonization has to recognize the value of permanent heterogeneity. So, in this lecture, I have attempted to deconstruct two objects naturalized and made hypervisible by the discourse of secularism, religion, and women. I concluded just now by touching upon one of the key factors rendered invisible by that discourse, that is caste. The discussion of that factor involves discussing what I call the failed project of creating Hindus, from the Puranas to modern Hindutva of the 20th and 21st centuries. We need to recognize that India is a collection of minorities, not a Hindu majority country, but that's the subject of another lecture. Thank you. So when Nivedita talks, and after you've heard her, what you should do is take a deep breath, count till 30, and then ask your question. Um, the other way is, I'm going to take a quick straw poll here. The tea is here. So, would you want to go and have tea first and come back to ask questions or ask questions first and then have tea? Ask questions first, okay. Okay. Pardon? No, no, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm very shallow. I'm tempted by all sorts of things. Very shallow. 
Okay, the questions would start batting first. Rajat. Hello, ma'am. Uh, thank you for that illuminating lecture. Uh, you talked about how state and religion co constitute each other, and you described how state constitutes religion. But is there a flip side to it? How does religion constitute state? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you for the lecture. I was, uh, I really, uh, I was really this, uh, what you mentioned about the movies. Uh, I am Pallav Tyagi. So you mentioned about the films that uh, they so often uh, hurt Hindu sentiments. And yeah, this is something, an uh, issue in our society. And uh, other things like Bajrang Dal, which is so prevalent in North, that's our also issue. What, uh, according to you, can be the solution of these things? One more question. One more question. Is there a question somewhere? Uh, a lady there. Uh, Jiang, keep going to your left and you'll find her. Don't fall off though. Uh, yes, your uh, question. Yeah, thank you ma'am for that lecture. Um, uh, Kahini. Um, so, as you mentioned that there is a one side of feminists who say that um, uh, it's uh, the individual choice where, whether to wear hijab or not, whether to uh, adopt a veil or not, and um, we do not have a say in that. Uh, however, even I do agree with that point. Uh, when you present that point even to a few feminists or academics, the usual question is that that choice is also um, made in a atmosphere of patriarchy. So, what should be the answer to, you know, make them understand this stance? Okay. Yeah, please. Um, uh, yeah, Rajat, <clears throat> uh, how does religion constitute state? Uh, so, what we see in all these instances that I mentioned, and you'll see it in many other instances as well, by, uh, by um, turning to the state for legitimacy, you are constituting the legitimacy of the state. So there is no, no religion which is saying the state should stay out always completely. No, because, for example, uh, the way in which, so if you think of the label of Hinduism, for example, um, what is the legal definition of a Hindu? All those who are not, this is the legal definition in the Hindu code bills, uh, in the acts, um, all those who are not Muslim, Christian, Parsi, or Jewish, which means that by leaving this broad scope, the idea that this is a Hindu majority country is something that secular discourse has also accepted. Periodically, there are groups which say we are not Hindu because we left Hinduism. Sikhism says we left. Lingayats say in the 12th century, our sage Vasavanna left. Uh, it's not a coincidence that Gauri Lankesh and uh, um, Kalburgi were also Lingayats uh, and they were assassinated. So when they try to leave, the, it's the court that decides. And Lingayats were actually given the status of a separate religion by the Karnataka state government. This was rejected by the uh, parliament, by the central government. So you see how the state religions, the groups that call themselves religious continuously have to turn to the state to uh, be recognized or not recognized as religious or as belonging to a particular religion. So the only way to escape that is to go <coughs> under the radar. But when you go under the radar, then you lose out on many things. There are other kinds of issues that arise. So you'll see that the state is continuously focused on bringing you into the radar. The Uttarakhand Civil Code is an example. When people choose not to marry, they're choosing not to be seen by the state. And the state is saying, no, you, we will see you also. <laughs> okay, hurt Hindu sentiments. Um, see, we have to insist that there is no such thing as one Muslim sentiment or one Hindu sentiment or one Christian sentiment or one left sentiment or one feminist sentiment. There is no one sentiment. 
these are all extremely contested and debated spaces. So when someone says that the image of an actor who played the role of Kali smoking hurts my sentiments, it may hurt your sentiments, but there are people who are non, these are non Brahminical goddesses who don't have husbands, they have not been spousified, they don't have children, they are fierce, they are non Brahminical, they are pre Brahminical, and they may do anything. And the people who worship those goddesses, their sentiments are not hurt. And they have to be called Hindu because they need the Muslim, Christian, Parsi. So who are the Hindus you're talking about? Right. So we have to insist continuously. I think our two values that we have to insist on democ are democracy and heterogeneity. The value of heterogeneity. I, I think, uh, the, so when, for example, I read Hindus allowed to worship in the basement at Gyanrapi Mosque, it's the Vishwa Hindu Parishad that has been allowed to do it, not Hindus. Who went there? Who, how many Hindus went there saying, we have to worship in that very space? It was a particular political organization. Name the organization. It doesn't represent us. Did we vote for the VHP? Do we vote for the RSS? Let the RSS dare to stand for elections. Let them contest elections. Let's see what happens. So we have to insist on that. There's no such thing as one sentiment. And so I would say, however uncomfortable, I would not even seek a ban on an anti-women or anti-feminist film. We have to counter speech with more speech. Where hate speech becomes action, that's a different matter. But where speech is speech, then we have to counter it with much, much more speech. I see that on your, on your, on the uh, notice boards of any university today. The counter speech. Um, look, when uh, when someone says that the choice is made in an uh, in an atmosphere of patriarchy, I'm not uh, sure if you were here. I did talk about the fact that all choice is made within constraints. So someone who tells you that choice is made within a, a, a within a, a constraint of patriarchy, look at the way every single one of us is dressed here. Nobody put a gun to our heads telling us dress in a gendered way and make sure you're covered from top to bottom. Look at us. Completely gendered, completely covered from top to bottom. <laughs> so how did we make this choice? Right? So that is the, the choice is always made within constraints. The person who tells you it's made within a constraint of patriarchy, ask that person how many choices they have made, which are not at all constrained by patriarchy. So then within that idea that uh, it, so there's a simple economic argument that Amartya makes, when you go to the market and you buy something, there is a constraint in, in, by the resources you have versus the price of the thing. So you choose to buy something within your budget. There's always a constraint. So uh, it's not, why is that particularly invoked for the whale is something we need to ask. Um, I love the word spousified, by the way. Uh, gosh, I mean, this is a lovely word. Okay, um, I learned something. Um, any more questions? Gentlemen there. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Um, Ma'am, um, you've spoken about how state determines religion and I mean the speech followed and there was an allusion to Sabrimala case. Ma'am, one of the petitioners in the case was a non-Hindu devotee having faith in Ayapa probably. So again, the question of hailing from a different religion and then obviously the internal choice of believing in the deity. So ma'am, how do we navigate the question of uh, locus standi in this particular particular case and also ma'am there's always a counter question like if you're talking of Sabrimala entry movement then why not mosque entry movement so how, how do we look at this through locus standi hi ma'am uh, i am arif mohammed i wanted to ask you a question you mentioned talal asad's argument where he says that uh, religion is a historical uh, category brought in by the west i was i was i am seeking your opinion about indian muslims in their fight against the rss what if they shun this category and start identifying themselves uh, as OBCs or Dalits or as uh, start asserting their religious identity? What do you think about it? Um, yeah. Anaga. Yeah, I'm Anaga. Uh, I, I was, it's always a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, I was wondering if um, the articulation or the understanding of women as religious beings um, in the eye of the state is also somewhere, uh, you know, being developed in uh, this 
work in the sense that uh, when we when we look at uh, women and say that uh, the philosophical whatever is your philosophical belief will not be uh, taken into consideration but the religious would be it is in a way saying that women cannot be uh, salvational beings which is a very brahminical way of understanding who can get salvation and who cannot but then uh, the argument that you know you can go back and see that there were more diverse uh, religions the tantric uh, and then um, women and their religious access is all, always amorous bodily fertility etc but uh, that salvational philosophical so it's like uh, it's like a double edged sword there's already a mind body uh, differentiation whether we want this embodied understanding etc but uh, what seems to be at the heart is that if you want to make a religious claim you have to establish yourself as a salvational being i was wondering if that is also at the heart of the problem <coughs> siddharth um see the, the what you have articulated is precisely the way in which uh religion and state are functioning today where you are also sucked into that discourse how do we determine locus standa you said now if religion is about faith why should who are you or i to determine locus standa of a faith which which includes the ayappa temple uh so not just hinduism in that broad category which i don't believe actually exists except as a legal category uh this thing this idea that someone who's not of that religion wants to climb shabrimala is not who who determines loka stand is it going to be the temple trust the temple trust is how is it appointed are they elected by all the devotees of shabrimala do all those who believe in ayappa sit down and decide who will be the temple trust does the temple trust approach the court does the person what is going on here you understand when you the moment you use a term locus standi you have stepped into a domain in which the state and religion are co constituting each other the religion is asking the state to determine uh, its own rights and the state is telling religion this is religion and the other thing is not But because if you take the ordinary devotee the ordinary everyday devotee who believes in ayappa does or in believes in let's say even co- who calls herself a hindu let me start with that does the ordinary believing person who calls herself a hindu care whether the lingayats say they are hindus or not if she's not herself a lingayat how does it matter to her she has a relationship with her god there are 3000 people who don't want to be called linga uh, hindu that's fine it's not even an issue who is it an issue for it is an issue for a politics in which numbers matter it is an issue for the politics in which majoritarian the idea that there is a birth based majority is crucial and we have to fight the idea that my majorities can be birth based on the accident of birth so i think we should ask ourselves how these quest why are these questions being posed in this way even in our own minds so the extent to which uh, they are co constituting each other becomes clear uh see i um or uh, if i there are multiple ways in which communities might seek to assert themselves against any kind of authoritarianism and uh one kind of response could be what you're saying that we will assert ourselves in terms of our caste another kind of assertion could be if you if you stigmatize us we will not be stigmatized we will speak up in that voice right that can also be a, t- a kind of assertion so i wouldn't want to arrive at not not only because i am not muslim but i don't think any of us should be arrive and that is an important factor that i am not muslim so i can't say how muslim people who call themselves muslim should respond but i feel that even within communities there will be multiple ways of responding to authoritarianism heterogeneity and democracy if there so if we say these are the two values then there might be groups which assert their caste them and the same group might assert their caste in one context and their religious community identity in one context and it could be argued that uh if hindu supremacism is using a religious category sidestepping is it may not be the answer so i would say that this is worth uh, this would be the subject of a, a debate uh, and it would not arrive at one answer and the how to resist authoritarianism will there will be many answers so i think we should think of it like that uh anagar's question is uh, it's 
thought provoking. So I'm, I mean, I don't think it's a question to which I can immediately give an answer. Uh, but I think uh, it, it seemed to me that you were possibly considering whether uh, non brahmanical religions in which the goddess is body, uh, does that not kind of lose the battle in a way against an idea that women can be salvational beings? And again, I would say that from your point of view or my point of view, perhaps, because we as feminists may be uncomfortable with the idea of woman as pure body, but these are beliefs which are not about women. They are beliefs about a goddess who is larger, who is something else. Now, we are not participating in that discourse. And so we have to, uh, so if we translate it to the terms of our discourse, yes. We could have this discussion, you and I. But uh, women who are performing these different kinds of women and men who are performing different kinds of rights to these goddesses of destruction and so on, uh, they're not considering people. It's not about humans. It's about something much larger than humans. And we can only try to understand it. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, women as bodies necessarily always a problem. I mean, I think it's important to also center our bodies, uh, male, female, other gendered bodies in the center of the discourse. I thought she was pushing the idea of non-transcendental idea of divinity and, and spirituality. I, 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 did, I did see that, yeah. but I thought, I thought she was uncomfortable with the idea of the non-transcendental. Non yeah. and, and what I'm saying is that that is a discomfort that might be ours as, as modern feminists, but not necessarily that of those who are in that transcendent, in right. that space. Right. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much, Professor, for that very enlightening lecture. So, uh, the sense that I'm getting is that my name is Anjali. <laughs> yeah. The sense that I'm getting is that one has to belong to a certain kind of group. And even the monolithic constructs of state and religion there has to be a sense of belonging to extract something out of those concepts. What uh, about people who may not feel a sense of belonging to either of the contracts, uh, um, uh, constructs, you know? What about lone rebels, lone uh, rebellious entities? Uh, I'm also reminded of somebody like Laleshwari, who was, you know, at the intersection of, let's say, Kashmir Shaivism and Sufism, and who would roam around naked. Uh, this was in the medieval times. And uh, so what if you are not able to, you know, where is the space for that person who cannot belong to a group, but is a rebel? Yeah. I mean, is the imposition of a collective necessary to fight either the state or the religion? Uh, hello, ma'am. Thank you for the wonder lecture. I'm Vishnu Priya. So my question is, uh, in your lecture, you mentioned about the double dilemma the women, uh, women face. So if you are going against the particular practices in our community then the other majoritarian community would say we will protect you or so and uh, if we are not going or buying the majoritarian idea then we are pushed into the patriarchal values of our society so where is the way out for us in this or uh, in this dilemma thank you yeah my name is Chahat uh, I want to begin by saying that whatever I knew is all thrown out of the window because secularism is problematized so much so uh, what I understood, for example, quoting Rajiv Bhargava's understanding of Indian secularism, where he says that we need to understand like the distinctive nature of Indian secularism, where it cannot be fully the separation. And of course, you said that it's already a febble. But uh, even taking that, he says that there has to be principal distance. Indian secularism is about a principal distance. And you have also problematized this whole idea of principal distance, wherein the state is trying to intervene to free certain groups belonging to that religion from oppression that constitutes that religion. But what I can understand is that you're saying that it can actually backfire where the state uh, is not doing away with that oppression, but just redrawing the, it's like drawing a new configuration of that oppression. So in that sense, how should the state intervene if at all, in matters of religion, where, for example, patriarchy constitutes religion. Thank you. Um, uh, Anjali, um, no, there's absolutely no need. Uh, I, I don't 
hold for the imposition of a collective. I was referring to the fact that the United States government and the Supreme Court and so on don't accept individual views. They only accept something if it is defined as a religious view. It's not even collectivity. You can't go before the Supreme Court as a group of pacifists who are left, etc., le uh, left feminist pacifists. They will not accept you. So it's not. Uh, so I was talking about the U U.S. state. Personally, if you are asking what happens to lone rebels, lone rebels are lone rebels. They don't look to a collectivity. They don't ask for permission. They don't want to be seen by the state or by anybody. They become deans. <laughs> <laughs> they become deans. Um, yeah, they, they, so I, I think it's important to talk about the lone rebel and to, and to respect that uh, uh, space of danger that they inhabit. And there's a kind of longing that we feel towards them where we are so much not lone rebels, actually, whatever Jodhir might, <laughs> might like. But you see, that's the romance. We would like to think of ourselves as, and I agree, and I, I too, and the, when you use the term lone rebel, there's a kind of a longing to it. I think there is a way in which it's, it's something that is a romantic figure, uh, and I certainly don't think any collectivity should be imposed. Uh, Mr. Priya, the, mm, the, so when I say it's a razor's edge, I don't mean that it is impossible to walk that razor's edge. So if you look at, as I talked about the Jadalia panel, it was possible for those women to actually, it's possible for us, it's possible for everyone to make clear what we are doing. That when we, uh, when we challenge the patriarchy of our community, we are not, in fact, ac accepting majoritarianism. So you be equally critical of both, right? Or the way Niaz was with the Bhartiya Muslim Maila Andolan, you challenge the Triple Talak in court, but you're not accepting uh, Hindu majoritarian politics. So it only means it's not as if we are faced with a choice where we have to be one or the other. I'm simply saying that that is the form that politics takes. And we have to be explicit about accepting X does not, or rejecting X does not mean accepting Y. You can reject both X and Y. Uh, and that is what a lot of feminist and left and so on politics does. You have to just spell out what it is that you're doing. Um, uh, Chahat, um, no, that, that's a, a really good question. And um, uh, see, Professor Bhargav's uh, idea of principle distance is a normative idea, which I have no problem with in principle, but uh, that's a certain kind of political theory which lays down norms, and it's a very important task. But uh, what does it mean in practice for the state to observe principle distance is not clear in practice. So can the state not uh, ban untouchability? Because a principal distance from religions would involve the state saying, that is your sphere, that is your sphere, this is our sphere, right? So that is in fact not possible. The state uh, should of course ban uh, uh, untouchability and, sh and there should be a space where one can turn to that is, what is the outside of the community going to be? If you say, so the principal distance position is a bit, I think, I'm not sure that Professor Varga would agree with me, but I see it in the same frame as the politics of multiculturalism, which sees certain communities as having rights, but the communities themselves are seen as homogenous, not heterogeneous. Uh, and so I feel the principal distance involves the state looking at several homogenous communities, and I'm not sure what that principal distance in practice would mean. So um, I think what we need to be recognizing and what I would want us to recognize uh, is that we have to stop giving a special status to something called religion. So if we believe that the state can be and should be an agent of social justice, and we fight again and again to make the state an agent of social justice, then religion is one form of community. Uh, and there, there are other forms of communities as well. And they should all be seen on par. What if a university De decides that uh, certain categories of students will not be treated equally, that will not be accepted. Why are religions allowed to do that? How is a religion, why, I mean, one should be able to say, okay, explain what religion is and what gives it a special status. And when, they, when you start unpacking that, I think that's what I'm trying to do here. My point is not to say abandon secularism, it's all over. 
my point is to say that secularism is a strategy of rule it's merely a strategy of rule it is compatible with authoritarianism it's compatible with democracy it's compatible with anti minority politics so let's talk about the actual values then what are we talking about democracy heterogeneity social justice ecological justice because remember that capitalism is entirely compatible with secularism in fact secular politics is about desacralizing nature and making it available for use by capitalism so secularism by itself is not something valuable is all i'm saying all the values that we want secularism to express let's express those values that's what i guess i'm thank you so much i will end the session the questions uh, uh, here um, we will go out and have a cup of tea and those of you who want to ask uh, professor menon questions can ask sneha please come up and uh, say nice things about all of us thank you thank you so much i will indeed obey orders uh, and not be unruly and say nice things <laughs> thank you very much uh, thank you to everybody who is present here um it is my honor and privilege to deliver the vote of thanks for the school of social sciences institution of eminence uh, golden jubilee distinguished lecture series and this particular lecture um which is facilitated by the support received from the institution of eminence um i would like to thank the dean of the school of social sciences professor jyotirvay sharma who chaired this lecture in his additional capacity as the head for the center for human rights um and also for his uh, leadership to the school of social sciences community and the initiative to have this lecture series um and this particular instance of this lecture uh, delivered by professor nivedita menon i would like to thank her first of all for accepting our invitation to be here uh and for delivering this lecture on secularism as misdirection i would neither be audacious nor be inefficient in the interest of keeping time and being between you and t outside to summarize what she said but i would like to thank her for drawing our attention to um saying things as they are so emphasizing on difference and heterogeneity and looking beyond spectacular to actually look at particular things that matter uh, from specific vantage points i would also like to slip in a little note of uh, thanks to the dean particularly for this opportunity to deliver the vote of thanks and share this podium with my teacher professor menon here and uh, also it's a privilege to be in a room full of uh, my students who are here to <laughs> listen to her lectures it it is particularly nice to be uh, doing that i would like to thank the uh, staff and uh, officers uh, at the dean's office and at the cv raman auditorium for facilitating the function here um also this wouldn't have been possible without the tireless efforts uh that have gone behind the scene of student volunteers who have contributed to several aspects in ensuring that this event takes place uh smoothly i would actually like to name them here uh chiang mong prithvi uh ganeshwar rajat atul dushyant shreya and satyaki um along with tong min thang um thank you to them and um thanks to all colleagues uh students as well as guests who are present here today with all of us uh for their participation and contributing to a very engaged discussion with professor menon today so thank you